that's coming up in the Supreme Court next week on the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the whole issue of the role of the courts has never been more starkly framed nor more urgently presented. And the importance of judicial engagement, therefore, has a context in which this, con this conference really resonates and is poised to play a very important role in discussing the, the potential that the courts have in securing and protecting liberty. Indeed, the, ninth, the 11th Circuit, in striking down the individual mandate in the opinion that is currently uh, going to be before the court next week, said explicitly that the Constitution requires judicial engagement, not judicial abdication. But the term judicial engagement did not originate with Obamacare, did not originate with the litigation surrounding Obamacare. Indeed, it goes back to the year 2005. And I coined the term then because at the Institute for Justice, we were experiencing quite a bit of frustration going into court and all too often finding that the judges were ready to rubber stamp actions of legislatures and the executive branch to re refuse to look at, to even refuse to analyze evidence that contradicted or refuted the government's position. And the judges that were viewed as having the responsibility, indeed the duty, to make up reasons for a law, even if those reasons didn't exist at the time that the law was enacted. At the same time, Frustration with the judiciary was being expressed in other circles as well. Advocates on both the left and the right have been engaged in an increasingly heated discussion, debate uh, about judicial activism and judicial restraint. Indeed, the word activism, judicial activism, has become such a pejorative that it's invoked by both the left and the right as a means of removing, effectively, the court from particular areas of, of the law for liberals to keep the court out of economic regulation and property rights. For conservatives, frequently to restrain the court in its oversight of criminal law and national security issues. Indeed, the more heated this debate has become about activism, the more its long-term effect has been to diminish and marginalize the role of the courts. What that ultimately means is that our liberties our liberties designed to be protected under the Constitution are increasingly left to nothing more than the self-restraint of politicians. Judicial engagement, in contrast, seeks to restore the courts into their proper role within the constitutional framework, within the three branches of government, to interpret the Constitution in a way consistent with protecting economic liberties as envisioned by the founders. And we believe that judicial engagement is vital to securing liberty and to restoring limits, constitutional limits on government. But it is not a simple issue. Indeed, judicial engagement ra raises very difficult issues that have, in many instances, no simple answer. These questions deserve to be fully explored, thoroughly debated, critically analyzed, and that's why this conference is so important. And why we are so pleased to have such a distinguished array of scholars with us today from all sides to look at judicial engagement, to explore and debate the role of the courts at a critical time in American history. And we are particularly pleased to kick off our substantive sessions with a keynote address by a dear friend of mine of the Institute for Justice and a renowned constitutional scholar, Randy Barnett. Randy is a, f a familiar person to, I think, most of us in this room because of his tireless work uh, analyzing the Constitution, putting forth a very coherent view of the rights and pr uh, protection of rights under the Constitution. He is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at Georgetown University Law School. He is the author of a widely respected <coughs> text on constitutional law and the author of a book, one of my favorites, Restoring the Lost Constitution. And he has also been the right man in the right place with the right ideas in the context of the challenge to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, where his theories, his analytical ability has, in many instances, driven 
the litigation and the analysis and challenge to that lawsuit to the crescendo that we will see next week. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce Randy Barnett. Thank you, Chip, and thank all of you. Um, it's my great pleasure to be the keynote speaker at this symposium on judicial engagement and the role of judges in enforcing the Constitution. I have to say that given my involvement in the uh, ch challenge to the Affordable Care Act as one of the lawyers for the National Federation of Independent Business, who are one of the parties in the case, uh, and uh, the briefing and the moot courts that I'm participating in, even my longstanding friendship for CHIP and the Institute for Justice would not have been enough to get me to commit to write a law review piece and uh, give, deliver a keynote speech on the week before a historic three days of oral argument in that case, which, in which I'm intimately involved, although fortunately not doing the oral argument myself. Um, that would not have been enough. What did it was the enormous importance of the topic, uh, the centrality of the topic for everything that I have been working on ever since I started doing constitutional law. Um, and it's for that reason that even though um, in some respects I did not want to accept this invitation, uh, for timing reasons I was compelled uh, through an irresistible impulse to accept this invitation. And, I'm, and now, that the, now that the job is done and the article is written, um, I'm very pleased uh, I've done so, especially given who else is uh, participating here. I, I am actually sincerely looking forward uh, to hearing the panels and the, com and the comments of people whose, whose opinions I respect so highly uh, over the course of today. And I regret that I have to leave you know, somewhere around 1, 1 in order to do another moot court for Paul, Paul Clement this afternoon, but otherwise I'm going to be here the whole time learning from you. Um, you know, this, this topic of judicial engagement is a subject of enormous importance and, and also enormous confusion. And so I consider it my job uh, this morning to get this conference off on the right foot by describing what judicial engagement is and what it is not. And just so you don't dismiss this as the opinion of one idiosyncratic law professor, I'm going to take as my role model of judicial engagement, the opinion in the 1954 case of Lee Optical of Oklahoma versus Williamson. Now, this is not to be confused with the 1955 case of Williamson v. Lee Optical of Oklahoma. The opinion I wish to consider is that of the three-judge panel in the, in the United States District Court for the Western District of Oklahoma, not the Supreme Court opinion of Justice William O. Douglas, although, of course, I will get to that at the end. But before I describe the approach of, this, of, of the three-judge panel, let me digress a moment to provide some background so that we can understand the significance of the Supreme Court's reversal of that panel's decision. In my previous writings, I've described a place called scrutiny land. In scrutiny land, the government needs to justify to a court its restrictions on the liberties of the people. Now, pretty much everyone today believes in scrutiny land. For example, few would deny that when Congress enacts a statute restricting the freedom of speech or the free exercise of religion, that a person whose liberty is affected may seek to have the statute nullified by a federal court because that statute is unconstitutional. To evaluate such a challenge, a court needs to ascertain the objective or purpose of the statute, whether that purpose is a proper one, and also to assess the degree of fit between the means chosen and the end being sought. What people today disagree about is exactly when a court may enjoy, employ judicial scrutiny to nullify a properly enacted statute. In short, they disagree about the proper route to scrutiny land, not the existence of this place. By the way, I, one of my students uh, this week said something about, referred to Scrutinyville, um, obviously trying to repeat this thing that I'd written about scrutiny land, and I looked at him and I said, I said, Scrutinyville, are you nuts? What could that possibly be? That sounds like a crazy thing. Not like Scrutiny Land, that's a real place, right? So, uh, and then one of the students piped up, well, Scrutinyville is the capital of Scrutiny Land. So I thought, oh, well, that's fine then. So the traditional road to Scrutiny Land was to assess the scope of the power being asserted by the legislature, as well as the appropriateness of the means chosen to execute such a power. For example, in the 1798 case of Calder versus Bull, Justice Samuel, Samuel Chase opined that he could not, quote, subscribe to the omnipotence of a state legislature, or that it is absolute and without control, although its authority should not be expressly restrained by the Constitution or a fundamental law of the state. According to Chase, quote, the people of the United States erected their constitutions or forms of government to establish justice, to promote the general welfare, to secure 
the blessings of liberty and to protect their persons and property from violence. <coughs> Picked the wrong week to actually get, come down with a very bad head cold. These, quote, purposes for which men enter into society will determine the nature and terms of the social compact. And as they are the foundation of the legislative power, they will decide what are the proper objects of it. In short, quote, the nature and ends of legislative power will limit the exercise of it, unquote. Now, Chase's opinion is usually characterized as founded on natural rights. But Chase focused not on natural rights, but on the scope of the legislative powers to which the people have presumably given their consent. He said, quote, there are acts which the federal or state legislatures cannot do without exceeding their authority. For example, and a famous example he gave among several, was the power to take property from A and give to B, unquote. Now the reason why Chase, off the reason Chase offers for why such a law was improper, I think is very revealing. Quote, it is against all reason and justice for a people to entrust a legislature with such powers, and therefore it cannot be presumed that they have done it. It cannot be presumed that they have entrusted the legislature with such powers as the ones on his list. Chase's analysis is therefore based directly on the notion of presumed consent rather than on natural rights. When the legislature claims a, po a power that is not expressly, expressly granted to it by the people, such an unenumerated power cannot be presumed, Chase said. Today, we would call such approach, modern lawyers would call such approach a clear statement rule. Now to be sure, natural justice and natural rights lurk in the background, but only as a way of interpreting a claim of implied power. The due process of law came to be thought to include a judicial examination of whether a particular statute was within the authority or power of a legislature to enact. In other words, it is part of the process of law, part of the procedure or process of law that the judicial branch ensure that a particular statute enacted by the legislature was within its power to enact. For 150 years, this traditional police powers jurisprudence allowed for judicial scrutiny of legislation to ensure that the purpose of legislation was genuinely to serve the public welfare, rather than any particular faction or class of persons. Such was the method of analysis of employed by the Supreme Court in Lochner versus United States. In Lochner, the court took as given that the states had the power to promote the health and, w and safety of its citizens. And for that reason, the numerous detailed regulations of the Bake Shop Act contained in the Bake Shop Act, regulating the bakery business, were never under any cloud. The only question considered by the court in Lochner was whether the maximum hours restrictions was, that was included in this very long list of health and safety laws was a genuine health and safety regulation of liberty. Finding no reason to single out bakers for this sort of protection, nor any threat to the health of the general public that would be caused by working more than 60 hours, the court concluded that the law must have been enacted for, in its terms, other motives, unquote. Namely, the desire of the legislature to serve the partial interests of the bakers' unions, who pushed for the measure, and the large unionized bakery companies, at the expense of small non-union bake shops, rather than a law that served the general interest. Then in 1931, the Supreme Court reversed that presumption, the presumption in favor of liberty, the presumption against legislation being in the public interest. In the O'Gorman and Young versus Hartford Fire Insurance Company case, Justice Brandeis upheld an insurance regulation because, quote, the presumption of constitutionality must prevail in the absence of some factual foundation of record for overthrowing the statute. As Justice Brandeis explained, quote, the record is barren in that case, the record is barren of any allegation of fact tending to show unreasonableness, unquote. But note that under this presumption of constitutionality, according to Justice Brandeis, it was still permissible for a person to challenge a legis legislative restriction on liberty by showing that it was unreasonable, arbitrary, or discriminatory. To introduce evidence, that's one of the things that Chip mentioned in his opening remarks, evidence of the arbitrariness, unreasonableness, and discriminatory nature of a particular measure. That road to scrutiny land, that traditional police powers road to scrutiny land, was made abundantly clear by the New Deal Court in the landmark 1938 case of 
that contains the most famous footnote in the history of the United States, footnote four, the celebrated footnote four, and that is U.S. v. Caroline products. But it contains this in the less well-studied body of the case rather than in the famous footnote four. In the body of the case, Justice Stone reaffirmed that, the tra that traditional due process scrutiny of the reasonableness of the statute was still available. Quote, he said, a statute would deny due process which precluded the disproof in judicial proceedings of all facts <clears throat> which would show or tend to show that a statute depriving the suitor of life, liberty, or property had a rational basis, unquote. And then later in his opinion, he emphasized the point again, quote, where the existence of a rational basis for legislation whose constitutionality is attacked depends upon facts beyond the sphere of judicial notice, such facts may properly be made as the subject of judicial inquiry and the constitutionality of a statute predicated upon the existence of a particular state of facts may be challenged by showing to the court that these facts have ceased to exist, unquote. That's the New Deal Court. Now, of course, Caroline Products is famous for its footnote four, in which the court said quite famously, and it's important for our purposes to remember what footnote four says in its beginning, there may be narrower scope for operation of the presumption of constitutionality when legislation appears on its face to be within a specific prohibition of the Constitution, such as those of the first 10 amendments, which are deemed equally specific when held to be embraced by the 14th." Unquote. But when this is combined, when the first paragraph of footnote four is combined with the traditional due process scrutiny that's contained in the body of Caroline products, we see that the New Deal court recognized not one, but two roads to scrutiny land. Which now brings us to Lee Optical of Oklahoma versus Williamson. The district court decision in 1954, not the Supreme Court decision a year later. In Williamson, the district court considered a challenge to a statute that restricted the activities of opticians in several ways. First, it barred anyone except a licensed optometrist or ophthalmologist from duplicating or replacing lenses. Second, it prohibited price advertising. Third, it barred opticians from have allowing uh, uh, optometrists or ophthalmologists on their premises to give eye exams. In short, it outlawed the business model that we have come to associate with companies such as LensCrafters. Essentially, pretty much everything LensCrafters or a company like LensCrafters does was outlawed by the state of Oklahoma. Lee Optical of, of Oklahoma was a subsidiary of a Texas company that owned a national claim, chain of eyeglass retailers. It was founded by a man named Theodore Shanbaum who was born to Russian immigrants who had settled in Chicago. In the 1930s, after graduating from the University of Chicago, Shanbaum earned his law degree from DePaul. He decided to go into the eyeglass industry after visiting his brother-in-law, an optometrist, in his home in Dallas. To reduce the startup cost of his new company, Shanbaum bought a, a used business sign that bore the name Lee Optical. And therefore, that's where the name Lee Optical comes from. It's no, there's no other connection between the name Lee and the Lee Optical Company. Now, it should come as no surprise that local ophthalmologists and optometrists were none too keen on this out-of-state competition advertising lower prices on, ga on glasses to consumers. Indeed, most of the famous economic liberty cases involve legislation siding with some firms in competition with others. In Lochner, the statute promoted by the bake shop union favored large unionized, union organized bakeries at the expense of small ethnic non-union bake shops. In Nebbia, the regulation raised the retail price of milk in the middle of the depression, I should add, um, but that sought to protect big milk distributors from competition from small mom and pop stores. Caroline Products itself protected the powerful dairy farm constituency from competition from lower priced filled, so-called filled milk that was skim milk combined with uh, oils in order to produce a more uh, 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 tasty uh, substance called uh, milnut. As with common practice, when considering challenges to the constitutionality of legislation in those days, the Lee Optical case was heard by a three-judge panel, which here included a circuit court judge, the chief judge of the district court, uh, and a district court judge. So those are the judges who heard this case at the district court. The panel quite consciously adhered to the post-New Deal allocation of the burden of proof, that is, the new presumption of constitutionality that had been announced by Brandeis in 1931. District Judge Wallace's restatement of the New Deal court's doctrine is worth quoting in its entirety. So here's from the opinion. 
All legislative uh, enactments are accompanied by a presumption of constitutionality, and the court must not invalidate an enactment merely because, in the court's opinion, the legislature acted unwisely. Likewise, where the statute touches upon the public health and welfare, the statute cannot be deemed unconstitutional class legislation, even though a specific class of persons or, or businesses are singled out. Where the legislation in its impact is free of caprice and discrimination and is rationally related to the public good, then you can't single out. It's okay if it singles out certain people. The court can only annul legislative action where it appears certain that the attempted exercise of the police power is arbitrary, unreasonable, or discriminatory. That is the traditional police power standard. In short, to sum this up, in the absence of a specific prohibition of the kind mentioned in footnote four, the court employed the presumption of constitutionality, as was then currently the doctrine, and then proceeded to analyze whether the restrictions imposed on opticians were arbitrary, unreasonable, or discriminatory in light of the arguments and evidence presented at trial. As the court summarized its approach when, quote, the public welfare is involved, the effect of the statute must bear a reasonable relation to the purpose to be accomplished and must not discriminate between two similarly circumstanced, group, circumstanced groups, re regulating one group but exempting the other, unquote. Now to see how this approach works in practice, let me describe just a small portion of the court's assessment of the prohibition on replacing uh, broken prescription lenses. I mean, there's, the, the opinion is very long. I commend the entire opinion to any of you who are interested to see how this proposal works. And in a lecture uh, of this length, I can only just talk about some of the analysis of one of the provisions, and that is the provision on replacing broken lenses, which remember, by the way, every consumer had to first have gone to an ophthalmologist or an optometrist to get that lens in the first place. Now we're just talking about replacing a broken lens um, um, either because it's broken, replacing lens either because it's broken or because you want a more fashionable or new frame in which to put a new lens that has to be a different shape than your old lens. That's the reason why you would go to the optician. The court uh, uh, begins by, notice, no, by, by noting, began by noting that this restriction diverts from the optician. Opticians were not the same thing as an ophthalmologist or an optometrist. They were not licensed doctors. Diverts from the optician a very substantial as well as profitable part of his business, unquote. And the court then concluded that, quote, the evidence established beyond controversy that a skilled artisan, such as an optician, can accurately ascertain the power of a lens or fragment thereof without the aid of a written prescription and can thus duplicate or reproduce the original pair of spectacles without adversely affecting the visual ability of the eyeglass wearing public, unquote. This process, quote, requires no unusual professional judgment peculiar to the licensed professions of ophthalmology and optometry, but is strictly artisan in character, unquote. My favorite part of the opinion is the court's discussion of the, quote, the, of the mechanical device known as the lensometer. I just like it because of the name lensometer, I want to, which, is a scient, which that scientifically measures the power of the existing lenses and reduces it to prescriptive terms. I once was at a, a party with an optometrist, and I said, you know, do they still have lensometers? Because I love the name lensometer. And he said, yeah, we still have lensometers. It's, it, yeah, he knew exactly what I was talking about. It's a lensometer. The court found that the operation of the lensometer does not rise to the need or dignity of exclusive professional supervision. A qualified witness demonstrated and testified that any reasonably intelligent person can be taught to operate the lensometer and to become qualified to accurately learn the power of existing lenses or fragments thereof within several hours. A fur as further demonstrated by the evidence, the opticians as a class have for a number of years used the lensometer in their trade, and the optometrists and ophthalmologists use this same device when wishing to check the power of lenses. And although a min uh, only a minority of licensed opth ophthalmologists require a patient to return to the examiner's office to check the accuracy with which the original prescription had been filled. Even in such instances, the lensometer is not operated by the physician, but by a clerk in the office. You go back to the doctor's office, a clerk's going to run the lensometer and figure out what the prescription was. As a result of this evidence, the court found that, quote, it is absolutely unnecessary to delegate to professional men the control of and responsibility for the just mentioned artisan tasks, where the opticians as a group possess adequate skill to fully protect the vision of the public 
in accurately duplicating existing lenses, unquote. And therefore it held, quote, the particular means chosen are neither reasonably necessary nor reasonably related to the end sought to be achieved, unquote. According to the court, quote, the rule is clear that where the police power is ushered into play, it must be exercised in an undiscriminating manner in relation to all persons falling within the same class or circumstances, unquote. But here, quote, not only is the relation to the object of the legislation questionable, but all persons similarly circumstanced pointedly have not been treated alike, unquote. Employing the same method of analysis, the court also concluded that restrictions on advertising prices and allowing eye exams by doctors on the premises were also arbitrary, irrational, and discriminatory. Now perhaps for our purposes, the most noteworthy aspect of this analysis is that the court spends no time at all discussing the origin, scope, or fundamentality of the right at issue in the case, which is simply the right to pursue a lawful occupation. Indeed, the court never specifically identifies the right in question, other than passing references to, quote, a long recognized trade, unquote, and its characterization of the skills and business of the optician as, quote, a valuable property right, unquote. For these judges, the issue is not whether this right can reasonably be regulated, of course it could, but how? And an analysis of the right itself does none of the work with respect to this question of reasonable regulation. All the emphasis is on the practical operation of the statute to see if, it is, if its discrimination against opticians was warranted even after adopting, adopting a presumption in the legislature's favor. In this regard, the court was simply following the injunction affirmed by the New Deal Supreme Court in Caroline Products. And now I'm just going to repeat, I'm going to repeat the quote from Caroline Products, New Deal Court case, which is still in part of the canon and held in high repute. Quote, no pronouncement of the legislature can forestall attack upon the constitutionality of the prohibition which it enacts by applying opprobrious, ep opprobrious, opprobrious epithets to the prohibited act and that, quote, a statute would deny due process which precluded the disproof in judicial proceedings of all facts would, would show or tend to show that a statute depriving the suitor of life, liberty, or property had a rational basis, unquote. But as we all know, the Supreme Court reversed that district court decision. The Supreme Court's decision in Williamson v. Lee Optical is not as famous as such landmark case, cases as Madison, as, as, I'm sorry, as Marbury, Dred Scott, Plessy, Brown, Rowe. These are cases you all know by one name. You don't even have to say V anybody. You just know what cases they are. Lee Optical really is not in that category. But it is repeatedly relied upon by the Supreme Court as the authoritative treatment of rational basis scrutiny of economic legislation. It is a fixed point of reference for all attorneys practicing criminal, uh, constitutional law. While most academics attribute the judicial withdrawal from policing economic uh, regulation to the New Deal, the previous analysis shows that the true credit should go to the Warren Court, and in particular to Justice William O. Douglas. Justice Douglas's approach in Lee Optical is easy to characterize. In place of the opportunity to present evidence showing that a particular restriction was arbitrary, unreasonable, or discriminatory, Justice Douglas held that legislation should be, would be upheld if the court could conceive of any hypothetical reason why the legislature might have enacted the restriction. For example, and I'm now going to, here's a series of quotes from the opinion of Justice Douglas. For example, although, quote, it appears in many cases that, uh, that, uh, that optic the optician can easily supply the new frames or new lenses without reference to the old written prescription, the legislature might have concluded that the frequency of occasions when a prescription is necessary was sufficient to justify this regulation of the fitting of eyeglasses, unquote. Likewise, quote, when it is necessary to duplicate a lens, a written prescription may or may not be necessary. But the legislature might have concluded that one was needed often enough to require one in every case, unquote. Or, quote, the legislature may have concluded that eye examinations were so critical, not only for the correction of vision, but also for detection of latent ailments or diseases, that every change in frames and every duplication of a lens should be accompanied by a prescription from a medical expert." Unquote. In response to the lower court's analysis of the inconsistencies of the statute, Justice Douglas replied in what has now become canonical words repeatedly repeated by the Supreme Court often. 
quote, the law need not be in every respect logically consistent with its aims to be constitutional. It is enough that there is an evil at hand for correction and that it might be thought that, a, that the particular legislative measure, 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 and that it might be thought that the particular legislative measure was a rational way of correct it, to re correct it, unquote. So whereas the lower court had looked to the unequal treatment of opticians as compared with ophthalmologists and optometrists, uh, Justice Douglas did away with such scrutiny. Quote, evils in the same field may be of a different dimension and proportions requiring different remedies. Or so the legislature may think, unquote. Or reforms, quote, may take one step at a time, addressing itself to the, to the phase of the problem, problem which seems most acute to the legislative mind, the legislature may select one phase of one field and apply a remedy there, neglecting the others." Unquote. So the differential treatment of one group as compared with another, a tip-off that laws are rent-seeking and not serving the public interest, is simply to be disregarded. According to Justice Douglas, quote, the prohibition of the Equal Protection Clause goes no farther than invidious discrimination, unquote. And how you prove invidious discrimination is, an, is, is another question. In sum, after Lee Optical, for all practical purposes, what had previously been a true factual presumption of constitutionality that was rebuttable by evidence would henceforth be an irrebuttable formal presumption, which is, as, all, as many of you know, not truly a presumption at all. But the Warren Court was not done yet changing the requirements of, due process, of the due process of law. Ten years after Lee Optical, in the 1965 case of Griswold versus Connecticut, the court invalidated a law banning the sale and possession of contraceptives. Writing for the court, none other than Justice Douglas himself pointedly refused to reconsider the reasoning of Williamson v. Lee Optical. Instead, and this is the key, instead of doing that, he chose to find a fundamental right of privacy in the specific prohibitions of the Bill of Rights to which, the footnote, to which footnote 4 had, reserved, had referred, the specific prohibitions in the Bill of Rights. To accomplish that, he was compelled to write one of the most ridiculed sentences in the annals of Supreme Court decisions. Quote, specific guarantees in the Bill of Rights have penumbras formed by emanations from those guarantees that help give them life and substance. In light of this story, we can now see why he wrote those words. To avoid reviving the other traditional route to scrutiny land via actual rational basis analysis, Justice Douglas and the Warren Court preferred to recognize an unenumerated right of privacy to be added to the other specific prohibitions in the text that the New Deal Court had identified in footnote four as outside the scope of the presumption of constitutionality. And thus was born modern substantive due process, whereby selected unenumerated personal rights, such as privacy, were to be given heightened scrutiny while mere economic liberty interests were subject to Lee optical hypothetical rational basis scrutiny, which is to say, no scrutiny at all. Thus, by this circuitous route did we end up with the modern debate between so-called judicial conservatives who cling really to the four corners of the New Deal's footnote four to protect only the specific prohibitions in the Bill of Rights against so-called judicial activists who hew to the Warren Court's approach of what might be characterized as footnote four plus with the plus being judicially selected unenumerated rights that are deemed fundamental by the Supreme Court itself. But the modern footnote four plus substantive due process doctrine differs markedly from the traditional pre-Warren Court approach. First, with the modern substantive due process, with modern substantive due process, one only gets to scrutiny land if one identifies a fundamental right, whether it be enumerated or unenumerated. Second, when a fundamental right is at stake, laws must be strictly scrutinized, at least in theory. Third, because scrutiny must be strict, only a small number of fundamental rights can be recognized lest all government power be undermined. Now to this some may respond, well, you know, to this Warren Court approach, some may and have reasonably responded, what, just what makes judges competent to identify and define some unenumerated fundamental rights or some unenumerated rights as fundamental while others are not? when even philosophers disagree about what rights are fundamental or not. It's a, it, it, that Warren Court approach invites that kind of response. But the lower court opinion in Lee Optical makes it clear that under traditional due process clause scrutiny, the courts need not speculate about fundamental rights. 
All it needs to do is identify what we lawyers today call a liberty interest. You don't have a liberty interest to rape or rob or steal or trespass, so those aren't even on the game. But as long as you're exercising what today would be called a liberty interest, it's just not wrongful behavior in that sense. That's all the courts have to do on the right side or the liberty side of the equation. Attention then turns to identifying the proper scope of the legislature's power, be it an enumerated power of Congress or the police power of states to protect the health and safety of the public. To identify legislation that is not in the general interest but serves instead to benefit some class at the expense of others, the court need not concern itself with the pre precise nature of the liberty or right at issue. Instead, it examines the fit and the purported end, the, the fit between the purported end and the means chosen to see if the, if the restriction might have been pretextual, you know, just might have been pretextual. While I would prefer that courts em employ a presumption of liberty, which was the subtitle of my book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, the kind that I think the court in Lochner was using, Lee Optical shows the power of judicial engagement even when a rebuttable presumption of constitutionality is applied. The lower court analysis in Lee Optical shows that actual rational basis scrutiny is both possible and realistic about the, it's realistic about the potentially improper motivation behind some economic legislation. By contrast, the hypothetical rational basis approach of Justice Douglas in the Warren Court is highly unrealistic and formalist. It's a formalist, irrebuttable presumption that says that all restrictions on liberty are really in the public interest if any possible rationale for the restriction can be imagined by a judge. The modern rational basis approach adopted by the Warren Court in Lee Optical was a judicial abdication of the judiciary's function of policing the Constitution's limit on legislative power. It accomplished this by combining its formalist, irrebuttable presumption of constitutionality with a judicially invented distinction between economic and personal liberties, a distinction found nowhere in the Constitution. Indeed, a distinction that runs afoul of one of the few rules of construction that is in the Constitution. And here is what it says. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed, shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. It's a rule of construction. Whereas the New Deal court disparaged the rights retained by the people by treating them less protectively than the specific prohibitions, it was violating the disparaging claw part of the Ninth Amendment. The Warren court from the Lee Optical case denied them altogether. They went from disparaging to denying. The lesson of Lee Optical is that the judicial protection of these retained rights requires neither their discovery and definition nor what today would be called substantive due process. It requires only the recognition that the due process of law includes a judicial assessment of whether a restriction on either personal or economic liberty is genuinely rationally related to an end that is within the proper scope of its powers or whether it is instead irrational, arbitrary, or discriminatory. And that is something that judges are quite capable of seeing whether or not they wear prescription eyeglasses. Thanks. I can take a question or two. Um, Clark. Do you have a sense to which courts believe it is genuinely doctrinally inappropriate to make the kind of inquiry that you describe the, the Lee Optical District Court panel making? on the one hand versus the extent to which they simply believe it would be unseemly and perhaps institutionally hazardous to make that inquiry in consistently? Well, I mean, if they're aware of the optical, which is every constitutional per law person who practices in, federal court, uh, in, in, the, in the Supreme Court is well aware of, um, they would think it, it was not within their province to do so. This, the optical is the standard that's, that currently applies. There may also be this issue of competency uh, or unseemliness, as you say, but I just was teaching the First Amendment this week, um, and we were talking about the various laws regulating campaign finance, and we were talking about the various laws uh, uh, that you know, protect, for example, against defamation and, and, um, and, and deal with uh, time, place, and manner regulations. And one of the things you notice when you start reading those cases with this eye, and, and by the way, that's all considered seemly, to use your word. All of those cases are seemly. Now, why are they seemly? What makes them seemly? What makes them seemly is 
the words in the Constitution that says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, press, or assembly. That's what makes them seemly. But nothing in the Constitution says anything about time, place, and manner regulations. Nothing about the in the Constitution uh, evaluates the end of the law or says you should evaluate the purpose of the law to see whether it's addressing expressive conduct or non-expressive conduct. And if it's expressing expressive conduct, it gets one treatment, non-expressive contract. All of this is seemly because of this one word line of authority, but it's all the same. That is, everything that the court brings to bear in a First Amendment case is this, are the same kind of tools of skepticism that it can bring to bear with respect to any liberty case. And if my question is, if the court is, not, is, is, is competent to do that just because there's a line of text that says freedom of speech, why is it, how does it become incompetent to do that when you're just talking about life, liberty, or property, which it's also just one line in the Constitution? Why is competency at issue? Not maybe judicial appropriateness in some other normative round, but just pure competency. They're competent to do it here, but they're incompetent to, to, to do the very same thing there. Um, and so for that reason, I don't think competency is really at issue. I do think it's a matter of judicial ideology. And the judicial, uh, judicial ideology is extremely powerful. We live in the post-New Deal world in which most conservatives, political conservatives, accept the post-New Deal world uh, and what's, what's sometimes called the New Deal settlement and liberals and, and progressives accept the post-New Deal settlement, and then they just de debate about what the terms of that settlement are. And mostly what conservatives, judicial conservatives, debate judicial progressives or activists uh, about are really what, whether the Warren Court was a proper deviation from the, tr from the true New Deal understanding. That's really what that modern debate is about. And it's just a far too modern, de narrow debate that it overlooks 150 years of a contrary practice that we distort if we try to interpret that practice in light of how we currently think of constitutional law. I think that's our time. Thanks very much.